think the story is not that economics provides solutions to anything, uh, but it provides ways of thinking about particular problems. Any kind of economic interaction, uh, there are so many different impulses and decisions that flow into the making of the outcome uh, that it's really very, very hard to say one person designed this system and should be accountable for this. Capitalism is uh, basically storing up assets that you can exchange in the future for something that you may not want at the moment, but that you may not even know that you want in the future. You might say that uh, penguins in the Antarctic have some kind of form of capitalism in the sense that male, uh, male penguins uh, like to apparently accumulate round pebbles um, that they exchange for sex with female penguins at some later stage. Both capitalism and globalization are here to stay, uh, but they're going to be transformed and uh, they're going to work in, in really qu quite radically new ways. And, So e economics, I suppose, is classically defined as the science of the, about the production and the distribution, the exchange of wealth. Um, so it's, it's a science of what we think is valuable. And in that sense, we think it's valuable to look at economics. Um, it's a particular way of doing that. And I think uh, you, you can see that there's not one kind of economics. And over the last couple of centuries, people have thought about economics in very different ways. And some people have objected even to the word economics. So um, until, until the middle of the 19th century, basically, I think it was more common to talk about the science as political economy. Um, and it's really Stanley Jevons, the British marginalist, who uh, tried to substitute economics for political economy because he thought that political economy gave too much of a sense of things being directed by a central authority. Um, but but that, that usage itself really comes from, from Aristotle and economics, uh, the household applied to the city, is, is the, the, the kind of concept that Aristotle had. Um, and some people really even push back on that. So uh, the Austrian economists, um, Hayek, uh, didn't like the word economics at all and wanted something else that was the science of exchanges. Um, but but I, I, I think the fundament is that it's, it's, it's the knowledge about what's, what's important, uh, what's valuable. And in this, that sense, uh, it's really always there at uh, the basis of every kind of discussion. Um, there's a second thought that occurred to me in this, uh, which is that um, many people think that economics has become more important over the course of the last century or so. And I think that's basically right. Um, but why it's right is quite interesting. It's because life in the modern era became basically more certain. You didn't need to worry so much about sudden mortality, um, you could plan for longer. Uh, and as a consequence, thinking about these longer term questions and viewing them through an economic lens uh, became, became more central. So um, since Aristotle, people have thought about economics as a central science, um, but I do think it's become more central uh, over the course of the last 150 or 200 years. large part of economics uh, doesn't have a direct uh, policy impact, but some kinds of e economics 
in some kinds of economists uh, think of themselves as very, very policy relevant. And, you know, probably I think, um, you know, that development is a development of the last hundred years or so. And above all, it's associated with the, with the Keynesian revolution. Um, in that tradition, uh, you're thinking of big aggregates, um, aggregate supply, aggregate demand, um, what governments can do to alter that. Um, Keynesian economics, I think, comes into its own, both as an answer to the Great Depression and as a way of conducting the management of a planned economy during wartime. And so the big mobilization of the Second World War in the United States and the UK um, is largely conducted in terms of these macroeconomic aggregates in, in Germany, the Soviet Union as well. Um, so all the belligerents are, are, are doing this. Um, but macroeconomics um, doesn't necessarily tell you what to do about making society more innovative or how to be more flexible or more active. Um, and probably some people uh, will, will, will then come to the conclusion um, that there's a, there's a really limitation, uh, a practical limitation on what a Keynesian approach can do. Um, and that thinking about other spheres of economic activity depends on these microeconomic calculations. And you know, one of the big developments more recently since, since the Keynesian revolution is, is the um, looking for microeconomic foundations for, for macro. Um, but putting that into a policy context is much, much harder. Um, so the more you go into the micro world, I think the less you really think that you can influence policy and be what you described as being an economic engineer. I, I think really from what we've been talking about so far, uh, it's clear that at least in my view, um, e economics is really very, very central uh, to discussions of the, of the public good. Um, and it's, it's, it's central as a way of aggregating lots and lots of individual decisions. Um, uh, so, you know, in many ways, it's a science of the interaction of lots of people in a big society and the outcome of those interactions may sometimes produce the public good, uh, but may sometimes be dysfunctional as well. And so you know, that's, that's also there, the room where economic thinkers will step in and say, you've got something here that isn't working properly. You've got an equilibrium that isn't as good as it could be. Um, you've, you've got a, or a disequilibrium. Um, and it requires some kind of corrective action. That's, that's again where this, this whole Keynesian arsenal uh, comes in. Well, there I think the story is not that economics provides solutions to anything, uh, but it provides ways of thinking about particular problems. And so uh, if you're thinking, for instance, about climate change, just to take the first of the issues you, you uh, raised, um, with, with climate change, um, the, the fundamental question is how to reduce the output of harmful emissions, uh, CO2 emissions um, that are pushing global warming. I mean, there are other issues as, as, as well, or water utilization. Um, but in all of those debates, uh, pricing is going to be really essential. So uh, we've had an era in which energy prices were really very low and that encouraged people to move all over the world and to consume a lot of energy. Um, if you're going to 
want to restrict uh, the emission of CO2 or to move to cleaner or more efficient forms of energy, then you're going to have to do that through a price mechanism. Um, and the price mechanism is really unbelievably effective uh, at, at uh, generating uh, solutions. And so uh, the, the fact that we're producing too much CO2 is not a problem of the, the, the absence of the application of economic models or economic science, but it's, it's, it's simply uh, the way in which people respond to, 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 to prices. Um, uh, you know, as, as, as I say, I think that this is, uh, this, this is really the, the heart of the uh, way in which economics can contribute to solutions. And you know, similarly, it's going to be useful in terms of thinking of the way in which we address pandemics. What are the relative costs? Um, uh, how do we get vaccines? Uh, how do we, we, we get more medications? Um, you know, all, all, all those things are really basically logistical issues, uh, but they're very, very often solved through price mechanisms. Well, I, I, I think when you think of economics as a science, it, it's it's less particularly oriented uh, to a world in which you can draw a clear line between a particular action and a particular result. So if you think of an area where I think the idea of liability would apply very precisely, um, the, the engineering of bridges, um, if somebody builds a bridge that collapses quickly, um, they've made a mistake um, and they should be liable for that. And uh, it's indeed a criminal mistake. Um, with any kind of economic interaction, uh, there are so many different impulses and decisions that flow into the making of the outcome uh, that it's really very, very hard to say one person designed this system and should be accountable for this. And you know, particularly when we're thinking about bad times in economics and crises and disruptions and challenges, um, there aren't very good options. And the question is often about choosing between quite unpleasant options. And so the outcome uh, often looks, looks uh, uh, quite bad. You know, I, I started off my career um, working on the German depression in the interwar period. And uh, that was often used as a textbook example of a mistaken economic policy uh, that the chancellor at the end of the brief experiment in democracy in Weimar Germany, uh, Heinrich Brüning, um, had this policy of trying to do uh, fiscal austerity um, and uh, it, keeping to the uh, fixed exchange rate. Um, and uh, in, in the late 1930s, it became uh, very, very fashionable to say this, this was a terrible mistake. But actually, when you start to look into the details, um, almost anything he could have done would have been pretty terrible. If he hadn't done the fiscal austerity, there would have been a more immediate banking collapse. Um, if he'd uh, broken the ex commitment to the fixed exchange rate system, it would have been a violation of the treaties and there would have been French uh, soldiers coming into Germany. And so it looked as if this chancellor, Heinrich Brunig, had very much less in the way of a room for maneuver. Uh, than his critics uh, subsequently thought. And so I, you know, I would find it hard to say Brunig is responsible for the collapse of the Banner Republic. Uh, you know, if you're looking for the collapse, you need to think of things that happened a long time before and really, really multiple interactions. And you know, similarly, I, I, I think it's hard to say um, that one policymaker uh, 
is responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, it, it, it's it's uh, a question of a mass series of interactions and innovations and um, unforeseen events. So, um, you know, I, 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 I do see the point that you're trying to get at, um, that we're often surprised uh, that nobody is responsible for things that go very, very badly wrong. Um, but on the other hand, the, the kind of mechanism that you have in the case of a collapsing bridge simply isn't there in the case of a collapsing economy. This is a question that is enormously interesting to economic historians because there are rather wide ranging, uh, wi widely uh, ranging chronologically um, accounts of capitalism. Um, and there are also very narrow accounts of capitalism. So the word itself really only begins to be used in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and so if you think of that linguistic approach, you might say, well, you know, capitalism is just the modern world. Um, but you know, when we were talking in the lead up to this, this discussion, um, I was in Florence uh, a few days ago. And you know, when I looked down uh, from the slopes of the hill of Fiesole onto Florence, um, it, it, it's, it's really unimaginable that this city wasn't full of capitalism in the late Middle Ages. And I, I think also, um, actually, if you, if you look at antiquity uh, at both ends of the Eurasian landmass uh, 2,000 years ago, or two and a half thousand years ago, um, uh, there, there are forms of capitalism there. And some people will go even further and say that um, uh, capitalism uh, can even exist in animal societies. Uh, so, you know, what is capitalism? That's that's the good question that you ask. Um, you know, ca capitalism is uh, basically storing up assets that you can exchange in the future for something that you may not want at the moment, but that you may not even know that you want in the future. Um, but if you take that definition, um, you might say that uh, penguins in the Antarctic have some kind of form of capitalism in the sense that male, uh, male penguins uh, like to apparently accumulate round pebbles um, that they exchange for sex with female penguins at some later stage. Uh, so uh, that's a kind of primitive accumulation. Um, you know, if, if you take this approach, capitalism is really pretty, pretty eternal. Um, and uh, everybody is going to do capitalism. And uh, you can find capitalism in the weirdest settings. So you can find it in, in the gulag in the Soviet Union, uh, that the prisoners are doing capitalism. You can find it in in, in, in Nazi camps, um, uh, e even the wildest societies, then as long as there are groups of people, um, they will act in some some kind of capitalist way. Um, you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm quite aware that most people don't really like this very extended version of capitalism, and so they will say that the society of medieval Florence, late medieval Florence, was merchant capitalism. And that in the 18th century, there was a kind of state capitalism that was run through big chartered corporations like the East India Company in England or in the uh, United Netherlands, the, uh, uh, the, the Dutch equivalent, the VOC, the Dutch East India Corporation. Um, or they look then to industrial capitalism in the 19th century. This is the, 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 the kind of modern version of capitalism or financial capitalism from the 1970s. Um, and you know, I think that kind of focus of where the, 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 the main innovation is, 
is, is, is going to change over time. Um, I personally think that the era of financial capitalism uh, is actually over now. And you, know, you mentioned at the beginning that we're in the age of a transition and that we're going to a, a, a world in which um, much more is dependent upon information um, and the use and uh, sale and organization of big data. Um, and that's not going to be done primarily through the forms of financial institutions that were pushing the capitalism that reigned between the 1970s and the global financial crisis. That's so different forms of capitalism, but really capitalism is something pretty, pretty eternal. I'm wondering whether this is a question about you know, what we call today globalization. Um, the globalization is a phenomenon that, uh, you know, again, I think is, 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 is pretty old. Um, uh, you know, long distance trade was a long standing phenomenon. And uh, we, we have the archaeology now uh, where we find um, Roman coins in Sri Lanka or on the coast of Vietnam or the coast of China, we have skeletons that have Asian DNA in Southern Italy or uh, European DNA uh, buried in the uh, coastal areas in China. So, you know, think uh, 2000 years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, there, there was a pretty, pretty vigorous exchange even. Um, but you know, globalization comes and goes, and there are periods in which there's more intense globalization, and then setbacks, and uh, periods of revulsion in the middle of the 20th century after the Great Depression. Um, there's a turning back on globalization. Um, but to some extent, there was a, a little bit of deglobalization in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Um, but I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the new story after the COVID crisis is actually going to push for more globalization, but rather on a different, different kind of uh, operating system. So maybe this takes up the, the themes that I was talking about very, very briefly before, um, uh, that there's a great deal more electronic communication. We can do things um, in the way that we're conducting this interview uh, in different continents. Um, we can provide medical services like that. We can provide legal services. Uh, so the, the, there are all kinds of things that are going to move in a new way. Um, we're also thinking about applying artificial intelligence, AI, in, in, in uh, many transformative ways. Um, so you know, this, this, this is going to be a quite different society. It's going to feel very different, um, uh, but it's still going to operate on the principles of exchange over long distances, storing up elements of value, exchanging them. Uh, so you know, I think both capitalism and globalization are here to stay, uh, but they're going to be transformed and uh, they're going to work in, in really qu quite radically new ways. And you know, what, one of the tests of that, I think, is uh, that, uh, that, that there's a profound process at the moment of rethinking what money is about. And so you know, money uh, is one of the things at the heart of the capitalist economy. It's the way that we do exchanges. Um, over the last uh, century, money was provided by states um, we're now thinking about alternative private monies, um, and that, that's, that's a really profound challenge, and it will affect the way in which states think about their monetary management. So I, 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 I personally can't really imagine anything else because I have, as you've noticed, rather wide 
and uh, uh, multifarious vision of what exchange and what capitalism uh, is, is, is about. Um, having said that, you know, I think there are a number of paradoxes in what we have as capitalism at the moment. Um, you know, one is that capitalism is supposed to be about the, the uh, widely disseminated, decentralized uh, distribution of decision making. Um, so capitalism is traditionally contrasted with the idea of a planned society. Um, it, it, it requires decisions that are not made centrally. We each make our own decisions uh, in, in capitalism. Um, one of the most striking phenomena of the recent decades um, has been the rise of a new kind of capitalism in which um, there really are sort of planning uh, mechanisms uh, that the algorithms that Google employs or that Amazon employs uh, are in a sense uh, planning instruments um, and uh, they're guiding the individual decisions. And so we, we think you know, it, it, that was also, it goes back really to the discussions of the early 20th century about planned economies. Uh, are planned economies possible? And uh, some people said, well, you can construct a planned economy with a lot of simultaneous equations if you solve them. Um, uh, but, but then the critics uh, came back and said, well, there are just too many equations to, to solve. Um, but the, 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 the growth of computing power um, is that you are, you're moving into a world in which those decisions uh, are really now capable of being centrally solved. And so you're overcoming this, this, this old debate, this uh, socialist calculation controversy that had Oscar Langer on one side and Friedrich Hayek on the other side, um, that um, some private corporations are looking like socialist planners, um, but there are multiple corporations that are doing this. Uh, so there are multiple planners operating at the same time and you know, they won't, I think, necessarily last for a long time. They will replace each other and they will succeed each other. There will be different, different, um, different trajectories there, uh, there coming up. Um, so you know, in, in some ways, I think you've, you've got, uh, as a result of the development of this this uh, weightless economy of the electronic communications of artificial intelligence applications, uh, you've got a kind of mixture of socialism and capitalism. And uh, you know, I, I sometimes think you could talk about it as, if you could make a word out of the two, um, so capitalism uh, would be a good way of describing it. It's, 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 uh, it's qualitatively, quite different, but it is a form of capitalism nonetheless.